All right, everyone, buckle up, because we are diving deep today. We're tackling philosophical health uh, with Luis de Miranda's book as our guide. It's a fascinating read, isn't it? It really is. And you know me, I'm all about actionable insights, so let's unlock some wisdom. Yeah. This book is like a user's guide to flourishing. And trust me, it's way more engaging than your average self-help seminar. What I find intriguing about Miranda's approach is this really cool blend of ancient philosophy with modern research. Yeah, it's not just about, you know, feeling good temporarily, right? Like, yeah. it's about aligning your life with what truly makes you you. Exactly. It's kind of that aha moment, you know, when you realize something's been off. Right. This book would probably say you're neglecting one of six key senses. These senses, by the way, they're not your typical senses, like sight or smell. We're talking about deeper ways of experiencing and understanding the world. Right. And they all contribute to a flourishing life. And first up is bodily sense. Which, and I think this is important to clarify, it goes way beyond just basic self-care. <laughs> okay, so what are we talking about here? Miranda's arguing that our physical and mental states, they're deeply intertwined in ways we probably don't even realize. He uses this example of the thermal grill illusion. Have you heard of that one? The thermal grill rings a bell, but refresh my memory. So imagine you touch two wires, right? One's cold, the other's warm. But get this, your brain interprets it as burning hot. Ooh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like trippy, right? Yeah. It shows how our brains construct our reality based on these physical sensations. Okay, so our senses can sometimes play tricks on us. We get it. But what does that have to do with living a good life? Well, here's where it gets really interesting. Spinoza, a 17th century philosopher, he believed this connection goes even deeper. He talked about embodied joy, which is this idea that joy isn't just a fleeting feeling, you know? It's a state of being like deeply connected to our capacity for action in the world. Okay, hold on. Let's unpack that a bit. So it's not just about being like happy in your body, but about recognizing your ability to make things happen. You got it. Think of it like that surge of energy and focus when you're totally absorbed in something you love. Oh, yeah. That's embodied joy. And Miranda connects this to the aboriginal concept of dream time. And before you ask, no, it's not just about literal dreams. It's this understanding that our minds and bodies are always regenerating, always in this flow of becoming. It's like we're all part of something bigger, constantly evolving. So feeling whole, it's not about detaching from the world. It's about integrating our physical and mental experiences within the world. Precisely. But then the question becomes, like, who is this self that's doing the experiencing? Yeah, good point. And that's where Miranda's exploration of sense of self gets really thought-provoking. He brings up this really interesting thing called the ship of Theseus paradox. Okay, ship of Theseus, hit me with it. So imagine you gradually replace every single part of a ship, like piece by piece. Okay, I'm with you. Is it still the same ship? Whoa, that's a head scratcher. It makes you think about what actually defines something, or someone for that matter. Right. And the book uses this to explore how our sense of self is this constant dance between our unique experiences and the influences of the world around us. It's like nature versus nurture, right? Mm. Are we born with a fixed sense of self uh. or are we shaped by our experiences? Exactly. Think about it. Your upbringing, the people you meet, even the shows you watch, all these things subtly shape how you see yourself, often without you even realizing it. It's true. Like, are we being our true selves on social media or just curating an image to please others. Exactly. It's a question worth pondering. And it's something humans have grappled with for centuries. You see it in Freud's ideas about the eyed ego and superego, that constant push and pull, right? Between our primal urges, our rational minds, and the moral compass society puts on us. Right, right. It's that constant internal struggle. Then you have figures like Max Stirner, advocating for radical individualism, rejecting any external authority, dictating who we should be. So are we slaves to our upbringing? Or are we completely free to define ourselves? This book really makes you question those influences and if they really align with who you really are. It's about taking ownership of your own narrative. And that leads us to Miranda's concept of well-belonging, which I find particularly fascinating. Okay, well-belonging. I like the sound of that already. Tell me more. It acknowledges that belonging is essential. We're social creatures, right? But it's not just about fitting in. Okay, so there's more to it than that. It's about finding your tribe, but also questioning your tribe, making sure it allows you to be your authentic self. So it's about finding that sweet spot between belonging 
and individuality. You got it. Exactly. And the book illustrates this with some really cool examples. Like, did you know there's this whole field called biophilic design? Biophilic design. Okay, you lost me. It's based on this idea that we have this innate human need to connect with nature. Okay, that makes sense. So they're incorporating elements like plants and sunlight, even water features into like buildings and cities. Wait. So you're telling me my houseplant obsession is actually backed by science and philosophy. You got it. And it's not just about aesthetics. Studies show that biophilic design can reduce stress, improve well-being. It taps into that deep-seated human need to connect with the natural world. Okay, that's pretty cool. So we're talking about belonging to a community, but also belonging to something even bigger than ourselves, like nature. Right. But doesn't this whole idea of belonging get messy? when you think about larger societal structures. Oh, absolutely. You're spot on. The book delves into these concepts of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, which basically explore these different ways societies function. Okay, break it down for me, because I'm not familiar with those terms. So Gemeinschaft, it represents those close-knit communities where relationships are personal based on shared values, kind of like that feeling you get at your local farmer's market, you know? Oh, I love a good farmer's market. Right. It's that sense of community, that connection. Now, contrast that with Gesellschaft, which is more characteristic of, like, modern urban life. Think, you know, bustling city streets. Interactions are more transactional, anonymous. Yeah, you might see the same barista every day, but you never learn their name. Exactly. And the book isn't saying one is inherently, like, better than the other. It's just highlighting this shift and the impact it's had on our sense of belonging in the modern world. It's like we're trading that close-knit feeling for, like, convenience and efficiency. Exactly. It makes you realize we need to find ways to cultivate those genuine connections even amidst the hustle and bustle. Like, the book gave this great example of the Surfrider Foundation. Ah, oh, yes. What started as a group of surfers concerned about pollution has blossomed into this global movement advocating for our oceans, our beaches. That's so inspiring. Yeah. It shows what can happen when people come together around a shared passion. Exactly. They have that esprit de corps, that feeling of unity and shared purpose. Right. But then there's the flip side, right? What about when that sense of belonging, it kind of devolves into tribalism? The book talks about this Japanese concept of tatme. Yes. Where people present this harmonious facade, even if it means like hiding their true feelings. It's fascinating, isn't it? It is. It's like on the surface, it maintains this social harmony, but underneath. It can stifle honest communication, critical thinking. Imagine constantly walking on eggshells, you know, mm. afraid to rock the boat. It can create this undercurrent of tension. Right, because then people aren't truly connecting. Exactly. It makes you think about the importance of finding a community that encourages authenticity, you know. Absolutely. Open dialogue, even when there are disagreements. It's about belonging to a group that challenges you to grow and evolve. And this actually ties into this complex idea of cosmopolitanism, which... Cosmopolitanism. So we're talking about, like, embracing a more global perspective. Exactly. Recognizing the interconnectedness of humanity. It's a beautiful idea in theory, but as the book points out, it can get a little tricky. How so? It sounds pretty idyllic. One big, happy human family. Right. But imagine feeling disconnected from your local community or struggling to understand the nuances of different cultures. Cosmopolitanism, while aspirational, needs to find that balance. So it's about finding those common threads without erasing what makes each culture unique, like appreciating a global art exhibit, but taking the time to really understand the context of each individual masterpiece. A fantastic analogy. And this appreciation for the vast spectrum of human experience brings us to Miranda's discussion of the sense of the possible. Have you ever noticed how our brains are kind of hardwired to imagine possibilities? Oh, absolutely. We're always dreaming up of what ifs and could be's. Right. And the book even mentions the study where people literally felt younger just by imagining they were back in time. Wait, seriously, just from like Reminiscing about the good old days. It sounds wild, right? It does. But this was a real experiment. Ellen Langer. They recreated this whole 1959 environment for a group of older men. Okay, now I need to hear more about how they pulled that off. They, like, decked out a whole building. They went all in. Old furniture, magazines, music, you name it. They had the men act as if it were 1959. Wow. Okay, so what happened? Did it actually work? The crazy part? After just a week, these men showed improvements in physical strength, flexibility, memory, even their eyesight got better, just by tapping into the possibilities of their younger selves. 
that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Our minds really are powerful things. So if simply believing something is possible can have that kind of impact, imagine what we could achieve if we really harness that sense of possibility. Yeah, exactly. It really highlights the mind-body connection and the potential we have to influence our own reality. Okay, but let's be real. Life isn't always about feeling young and invincible. And the book also talks about this dark night experience, which is, well, a bit less cheery. Yeah, Dark Knight doesn't exactly scream sunshine and rainbows. Not exactly. So what's that all about? It's about those periods in life where you might experience deep despair, doubt, maybe even a sense of meaninglessness. It's like the world has lost its vibrancy. Everything seems bleak. Oof. Yeah, I've definitely had those moments where I'm just going through the motions. Not exactly a fun place to be. No, definitely not. But here's the thing. While it can be incredibly challenging, the book suggests that these dark night experiences, they can also be opportunities for profound growth and transformation. Okay, I'm listening. How do you go from feeling totally lost to like a phoenix rising from the ashes? Well, think of it this way. When those illusions we build around ourselves crumble, when our carefully crafted beliefs about how the world works are shaken, it creates space for something more authentic to emerge. So it's like hitting the reset button. A chance to rebuild from a place of greater self-awareness. Precisely. You can reevaluate your values, your priorities, what truly gives your life meaning. It's not about staying stuck in that darkness, but using it as fuel for growth, for stepping into a more truthful and meaningful version of yourself. It's about cultivating eudynamia. Yes. That's right, isn't it? Eudy what was it? Eudynamia. Eudynamia. I knew that. I'm pretty sure I aced that on my philosophy exam back in the day. But seriously, what does that even mean? chuckles. It's a mouthful, right? It is. But it perfectly captures this idea of living a life that's not just about fleeting happiness, but about fulfilling your potential, aligning with your true purpose, finding that deep sense of meaning and satisfaction. So it's about striving for something more, something beyond just feeling good in the moment. Exactly. It's about using your unique talents and passions to make a positive impact. It's about embracing challenges as opportunities for growth, always remembering that sense of the possible. Which brings us to this idea of compossibility, right? Yeah. It feels like we're building towards something here. We are. And compossibility is a crucial piece of the puzzle. It was this cornerstone of Leibniz's philosophy, this idea that for something to be truly possible, it can't just be some like pie in the sky idea. It needs to harmonize with the way the world actually works. So it's about being realistic with our dreams, like not aiming too low, but also not setting ourselves up for disappointment by chasing after things that are like just never going to happen. Exactly. It's about finding that sweet spot between ambition and feasibility, pushing boundaries, but respecting the laws of reality. You know, your actions have consequences. Right, right. And sometimes the most innovative solutions come from working within constraints. It's like that old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Exactly. Think of it like a sculptor working with this unique piece of stone. They don't try to force the stone into something it's not. They listen to its inherent properties and work with them to create something beautiful. That's a great analogy. So it's about working with what is, but always being open to what could be. You got it. It makes me think about this Akan concept of Kra, this idea of like a divine essence within each of us, guiding our destiny, but also connecting us to something much larger than ourselves. Ooh, that's a beautiful connection. It highlights this interplay between individual potential and this universal harmony. Like we're all individual notes in this grand symphony, each playing our part in creating something beautiful and meaningful. Okay, I love that. But even with all the beautiful possibilities, it can feel overwhelming, you know, without some direction. Oh, absolutely. And that's where sense of purpose comes in, right? I got it. And this book doesn't mess around. It brings in examples ranging from the suffragette movement to Nelson Mandela. Exactly. A sense of purpose isn't some vague self-help buzzword. It's the driving force behind some of the most powerful movements and personal transformations in history. It's like the suffragettes who fought tirelessly for women's right to vote. I mean, facing incredible opposition, even imprisonment, for their beliefs. Right. Their sense of purpose fueled their courage, their determination. They envisioned a more just and equitable world and dedicated their lives to making it a reality. And then you have Nelson Mandela. Enduring decades of imprisonment for his unwavering commitment to ending apartheid in South Africa, these figures had this unwavering belief in something bigger than themselves. It makes you wonder, like, how different the world might look if we all tapped into that kind of purpose. 
It's inspiring. It is incredibly powerful, but as with anything, good intentions aren't always enough. Remember the story of the Chinese sparrow campaign? Oh, right. Wasn't that supposed to, like, increase grain production or something? Yeah. In the 1950s, Mao Zedong, he ordered the extermination of sparrows. They thought they were eating too much grain. Okay. Millions of sparrows were killed. It seemed like a good idea at the time, right? I mean, who doesn't want more food? Right. It sounds pretty logical on the surface. Exactly. But they didn't anticipate this massive ecological ripple effect. What happened? Well, sparrows also eat insects. Oh. Without them? Locust populations exploded, devastated crops, leading to widespread famine. It's a stark reminder that even with the best of intentions, it's crucial to consider the interconnectedness of all things. And the potential unintended consequences of our actions. Exactly. That's a good reality check. Right. We can't get so focused on just the immediate outcome. We need to consider the bigger picture, you know. Absolutely. The long-term impact of our choices. And that's where developing a strong philosophical sense becomes essential. There it is again, that philosophical sense, like the common thread weaving through all these ideas. It is. And it's more than just having a purpose. It's about examining it you know, through a critical lens, considering different perspectives, and making sure it aligns with a compassionate and well-informed worldview. So how do we do that? How do we avoid falling into that trap of thinking we have all the answers? Right. You know, like what happened with the sparrows. That's where intellectual humility comes in. It's about recognizing that we don't have all the answers, being open to other perspectives, and approaching these complex issues with a willingness to learn and adapt. It's about recognizing that our individual understanding is just one small piece of a much larger puzzle. Precisely. And that leads us perfectly into Miranda's exploration of philosophical sense itself. Okay, so we're talking about developing this philosophical sense. But I have to admit, it sounds kind of intimidating, like something you'd study in a dusty old library, you know, not something you can actually, like develop. I get it. It sounds kind of grand, doesn't it? But really, it's about connecting the dots, finding your unique place within the grand scheme of things. And Miranda uses this really compelling example with the story of Mama and Hyder. Mama and Hyder. Okay, remind me who they are again. They're from this small village in Guinea-Bissau. Mama is known for her wisdom, and Hyder, he comes to her for help. His father passed away, and the land he left behind needs to be divided fairly among Hyder and his brothers. Ah, right, right. Yeah. And the land was, like, oddly shaped. The will wasn't very specific. Exactly. A recipe for some family drama. For sure. So how'd they sort it out? Well, Mama, she could have easily just imposed her idea of fairness, but she knew that wouldn't really resolve the conflict. Instead, she brought the brothers together, facilitated a conversation, encouraged them to share their perspectives, their needs, their understanding of their father's wishes. So she's like a philosophical mediator, helping yeah. them to tap into their own sense of fairness and reason. Precisely. And through this open dialogue, they found a solution everyone could agree on. And it strengthened their bond in the process, which I think beautifully illustrates how a strong philosophical sense isn't just about, you know, individual reflection. It ripples outward, impacts our relationships, our communities. It shows how philosophy can be this force for harmony, for understanding, yeah. even when there's conflict. Right. But then you have things like, you know, social Darwinism, which kind of took a very different approach, using philosophical ideas to justify some pretty uh, harmful things. Absolutely. A cautionary tale, for sure. Yeah. So what went wrong there? Well, social Darwinism, they basically tried to apply... Darwin's principles of natural selection to human societies, okay. often with the implication that only the fittest individuals or groups deserve to thrive. Yikes. So it was used to justify social inequality, even racism. Unfortunately, yes. Wow. Okay, so that's a pretty stark example of how philosophical ideas can be misused. It highlights the danger of blindly following any ideology, you know, even one that claims to be rooted in science, yeah. without that critical examination. Right, right. We can't just accept ideas at face value. We have to really engage with them, question their assumptions, consider those potential consequences. Exactly. So how do we do that? How do we make sure our philosophical explorations are leading us towards a more compassionate and just world, not away from it? That's where a discerning philosophical sense becomes so crucial. It's about cultivating intellectual humility, acknowledging that we don't have all the answers, and being open to learning from different perspectives. It's like that saying, the only true wisdom is knowing you know nothing, or something like that. Exactly. It's about approaching these big questions with curiosity, not certainty. And the book actually offers a framework for doing just that, 
by referencing James W. Sire's work. Okay, what does he suggest? So Sire's book, The Universe Next Door, outlines all of these different worldviews, right? From Christian theism to naturalism to postmodernism. Wow, okay, that's a lot of ground to cover. It's a lot. Yeah. But it's not about telling you what to think. It's about giving you a framework for understanding the different lenses through which people see the world. So it's like a crash course in comparative philosophy, yeah. helping you step outside your own bubble, see things from different angles. Exactly. And that's crucial, especially today, when it's so easy to get stuck in those echo chambers. Where everyone thinks the same way. Exactly. Developing a philosophical sense is about embracing intellectual diversity, recognizing that there are many valid ways of looking at the world. It's about recognizing our shared humanity, but also appreciating the like beautiful complexity of our individual experiences. Right. Right? Yes. But with so many different perspectives out there, it can feel kind of overwhelming. Like, where do you even begin? Right. Well, it's not about memorizing philosophical theories or like choosing the right one. It's about developing those critical thinking skills to engage with these ideas, identify their strengths and weaknesses, and ultimately formulate your own informed worldview. So it's less about finding all the answers and more about asking the right questions. Yes. It's about cultivating that spirit of curiosity, openness, a willingness to engage in respectful dialogue. Even, or maybe especially, with those who hold different views. Exactly. It's about recognizing that true understanding often lies somewhere in that, like, messy middle. Yes. In that space between different viewpoints. Precisely. And that brings us to this essential aspect of philosophical health that I think often gets overlooked. This realization that our well-being is deeply interconnected with the well-being of others. Yeah. And the planet itself. It's like that saying, no man is an island. Exactly. They're all part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And the book illustrates this beautifully with the story of the sky people and the earth people. The sky people and the earth people. Okay, I don't think I've heard this one before. So the sky people, they're all about dreams and imagination. While the earth people were more grounded, practical, and they lived in relative harmony, right? Until their differences led to this imbalance. The sky people forgot to care for the earth. The Earth people became stuck in their ways. It's like they each had a piece of the puzzle, but they needed each other to create this complete picture. Exactly. And it wasn't until they learned to embrace both their similarities and differences to appreciate the value of both dreaming and doing that they restored that harmony and truly thrived. It's like a powerful reminder that our personal well-being, it's totally linked to the well-being of the collective. We can't truly flourish in isolation. Absolutely. And this understanding, it's fundamental to a robust philosophical sense. It's recognizing that we're all connected. Our actions have consequences that extend far beyond ourselves. And this is where creolectic intelligence comes into play. Creolectic intelligence. Okay, you're going to have to break that one down for me. It sounds a bit like something out of Star Trek. It does have a certain ring to it, doesn't it? But think of it as this dynamic interplay between your analytical mind and your creative spirit. It's about moving beyond just dissecting information and tapping into your intuition, your imagination, your capacity for empathy. So it's about using both our heads and our hearts to make sense of the world. You got it. It's about recognizing that logic and reason, they're essential, but they're not the only tools at our disposal. We also need to cultivate our capacity for compassion, for creative problem solving, for envisioning new possibilities. It's about seeing the world not just as it is, but as it could be. Precisely. And that's where the real magic happens. When we combine the analytical with the imaginative, the practical with the visionary. So how do we actually develop this creolectic intelligence? Is it something we're born with or can we cultivate it? That is the million dollar question. And thankfully, it seems we're not just stuck with whatever we're born with. The book suggests that while some people might be naturally inclined toward this kind of thinking, we can all strengthen it through practice, through intention. So it's like a muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. Exactly. And the book actually gives us some tools, some techniques to do just that. Things like mindfulness practices, engaging with art and nature, cultivating a sense of curiosity, wonder. It's about expanding our awareness deepening our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. Yes. And then tapping into that like innate capacity for creativity and connection. Becoming more than just thinkers, right? Becoming mm -hmm. creators, innovators, agents of positive change. It's about becoming active participants in shaping our own destinies. Yes. But it also goes beyond that, doesn't it? Yeah. It's about recognizing that our individual journeys, they're all interwoven with right. something much larger. 
you hit the nail on the head. It's like we're all adding our own unique thread to this grand tapestry of human experience. It's a beautiful way to think about it. Our beliefs, our actions, our interactions, they all contribute to this collective consciousness. It's shaping the world around us. Which brings up a question that's been kind of swirling in my mind throughout this whole deep dive. If our understanding of the world really does shape our reality, what kind of reality are we collectively creating through our individual and collective philosophical senses? That's the question, isn't it? It's a question we each must grapple with as we strive to live these lives of purpose and meaning. And it reminds us that our individual journeys of philosophical growth, they have implications far beyond ourselves. It's a call to action, a reminder that our personal growth and the world we create are totally linked. Precisely. As we cultivate our own philosophical health, let's remember, we're not just cultivating our own well-being. We're contributing to a world where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. It's about embracing our interconnectedness, our shared humanity, and working together to build a future that reflects the wisdom and compassion we've been exploring today. It's about recognizing that we're all in this together, mm -hmm. writing the next chapter of the human story. And that's a story I'm excited to be a part of.